Hi everybody, this is Dr. K from Holistic Minds. I am so proud to be introducing Dr. Scott Antoine with you. He, he is a brilliant physician practicing in Indiana who has so much experience with mold, chronic infections, all kinds of really unusual things. And he's basically the doctor that people go see when they don't know what else to do. He's kind of the doctor of last resort. And he has this incredible uh, story of how, you know, he, he journeyed through medicine and uh, Dr. Antoine, I'd love for you to share your story instead of me just uh, going on because you've been in the military, then you were in the emergency department and from there you started getting into the, these very unique domains of medicine and I, I just love for people to hear your story. Sure, so, um, so I have a daughter, her name is Emma, she's 17 right now and she was 12, she loved to take rides to the grocery store with me, help me all the time when we went. And one day when we went, as we were getting checked out, she started straightening the cans and lining everything up on the conveyor belt as they were checking things out. I didn't think much of it and I would kind of mess them up and she would laugh and straighten them up until it became a bit of an impediment to get us getting checked out. At which point I said, come on, Emma, just stop. And she really had a hard time doing that. And I didn't think anything of it until uh, a few months later when she came to her mom, Ellen and I, my wife, Ellen is also a physician. And she said, I think God's mad at me. Um, I, I think I'm not a very good person. And shortly it escalated from there. She uh, refused to eat the food we gave her. She was insisting that if we served chicken, that it was raw and she was gonna get sick. Oh. We also had some issues with bladder control and ended up having insomnia and this once compliant, sweet, servant-hearted girl uh, became really defiant. And so it really caused an uproar in our whole family. And so we were obviously concerned, didn't know what was going on, didn't recognize it even though we had been physicians for years. And so her mom, doing what her mom does best, hit the medical literature, searched tirelessly, and then came to me one night at about 10 o'clock and she said, I've got it. I know what this is, this is PANDAS. I hadn't really heard of it before, and she explained it was pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with strep. Basically, some kids, after they get an infection with strep and subsequently with other things we found out, um, will get brain inflammation and then develop these characteristic behaviors. They have OCD type behavior, some stop eating. Uh, they also have insomnia. Defiance is typically part of the picture, and about 93%, if you look at the literature, have issues with bladder control, either have bedwetting in the middle of the night or during the day, have accidents, even older kids. So uh, once we found that out, um, I called the head of the infectious disease uh, at our local pediatric specialty hospital. And he got on the phone and said, pandas doesn't exist. Um, there's really no way that I can help you. And if you've ever wanted to crawl through a phone and <laughs> just out of pure frustration, and so we kept looking. We weren't about to give up on our daughter and ended up calling um, a physician we had heard about, Dr. Kenny Bach in New York. Uh, we had seen him lecture before. And my wife actually saw him lecture on pandas once. So we called him, went to see him. At this point, we had already checked my daughter for infections and uh, run some initial labs and actually had started her on some antibiotics since her strep titers were very high. So he saw her and he said, sure enough, it, this is pandas and she really needs intravenous immunoglobulin, also called IVIG. And so um, we came home and the first call I made was to another specialist who I knew gave children IVIG for other reasons and called and sort of got the same response. Um, and he sort of said, pandas, I'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I'm, I don't know why you haven't started your daughter on antipsychotic medication and mm -hmm. hospitalized her. And that was sort of another blow. I sort of slammed the phone down and, and just, if you know anything about my wife and I, we don't give up and we weren't about to give up, you know? And so ultimately we searched, I found a physician in Chicago who ended up giving her IVIG. Within four days, four days, her symptoms were virtually gone. And wow. I just think back to then and think, what if I didn't, what if I gave up? What if I just put her on medication? What would the outcome have been? Would she have scored the winning goal in varsity soccer this last year and broke mm -hmm. a three-year curse with her school? Would she have a division one soccer scholarship now? Would she be as social and outgoing and kind as she is now? And I can only imagine what happens to people who aren't physicians because we, we certainly have to run around. So 
that was part of our journey into functional medicine and just thinking, you know, patients deserve more than this. They don't deserve the status quo. Somebody's got to champion excellence and look into things and, and ask hard questions. And when things don't make sense, not just dismiss it, but really find the reason. Yeah. And you were in emergency medicine at the time, because that, that's, that's your background. That's right. So I've, I still practice in the emergency department about four shifts a month. Most of my time spent in our functional med and integrative medicine office. But I've practiced emergency medicine for about 25 years at that point. I suppose it, it was probably uh, 17, 18 years at that point. So I'd see a lot of stuff but nothing like what, what had gone on with her. And, and we had opened our functional medicine practice at that point. We're already starting to see unusual presentations of, of disease in patients. And, and she, she was kind of the, the tipping point for you to really get into this out of necessity. She was, and we had seen other patients and had done a lot of metabolic work um, in our functional medicine office, help people with weight loss and control their cholesterol, hypertension and also dealt with some autoimmune diseases, but really nothing like what was going on here. It was so multi-system and so strange compared to anything that you've heard. Uh, but those are the patients that we really see now. So that, um, our practice really took off after that because we decided we wanted to treat the patients. We are the doctors of last resort. It's funny that you said that. Um, we wanted to treat those patients that have the under misunderstood or the underdiagnosed disease or the people that are told at times it's in your head or there's really nothing to be done because we always say that not everyone can be cured, but everyone can be healed in some way. And that's really what we strive to do. Well, thank you for doing what you do. Now, you, you also see, so you, you take care of a lot of patients with PANDAS, which is mm -hmm. basically these poor children who have an immune reaction to strep and their immune system or their nervous systems go completely haywire, as you saw with your daughter. Uh, what other things do you see in these children? So if, if, you, if you're a parent kind of standing on the other side, what are some things that parents would see um, that, that would be indicative that they're or suggesting that their child may have pandas? So what we tend to see, um, if you look at the definitions of, of pandas and um, pans which come from uh, and I, I may use the term PANS here as well. So PANDAS was what was originally described, was associated with strep bacteria. Since then, we've found that some kids will present with similar symptoms, actually exactly identical, uh, even when strep does not seem to be present. We can't find an elevated strep titer, they've had no recent illness. And now it's recognized, uh, so it's not associated with strep, but we call it pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome. They've actually proven associations with influenza, um, also with mycoplasma, which is another type of respiratory bug. Uh, and it's thought that Lyme disease itself may have uh, an association there as well. So the most common presentations, folks will call our office and they'll say, my child's experienced a sudden change in behavior. Usually it's, it can be within 24 hours. It can be usually within three to four weeks. They will notice a change. The child will either have restrictive eating. Um, they will say, I don't want to eat certain types of food, it's too hot, it's too cold. In my daughter's case, it's undercooked, it's gonna make me sick. Sometimes they feel as if they're choking. Mm. They'll complain of that or that they can't chew the food. Um, or you'll see kids with uh, obsessive compulsive type behaviors. Um, hand washing, in my daughter's case, she was washing her hands until they were raw. Wow. And just convinced herself or her brain convinced her from inflammation that she was dirty. Um, you will also um, see some children that are afraid to make a decision or afraid to throw things away. Um, but it really, it's, it's obvious when it happens. It really, uh, it's profound and it really causes high anxiety in these kids. So they will end up not being able to go to school um, or not being able to do normal activities. Um, they may avoid activities. And the hard part is a lot of times they won't tell you why. Um, mm -hmm. Once we've gotten a lot of these kids better, they will subsequently come back and say, you know, the reason I was doing this particular behavior was because I had the strong feeling if I didn't, my mom would die or my little brother would get sick or run away. So, and they really don't make sense. It's hard to sort of reason with them when they're in this state. So typically one or both, my daughter actually had both OCD traits and some difficulty with food, although that was fairly short lived, thankfully. With some of these kids, if that gets bad enough, they can have weight loss and malnutrition. So, wow and end up hospitalized from it. Um, 
as I said previously, about 93% of the time, according to the National Institute of Health, these kids will get um, problems with bladder, um, sudden urge to, ha- to go to the bathroom, urinating an awful lot, or wetting the bed or wetting their pants, um, even when they're well past the age when that should, they should be potty trained and they've previously been potty trained. Sleep disturbance is almost 100%. Um, difficulty getting to sleep, difficulty staying asleep, also with a lot of restlessness um, when they're sleeping, early waking, and their behavior, defiance type behaviors, tends to get a little bit worse at night. So mm-hmm. with their own daughter, she uh, broke the door handles on our room several times when we would lock our door just to get a respite from her continued defiance and behavior and screaming. And it really took a toll on her brothers. She has four brothers as well. And there were times when we had to take her brothers out and my wife would stay in a hotel with them. I would stay home with her just because wow. that it was a desperate time. So these are the kinds of things. And it's typically not mild when you see it. Um, I do have patients, the parents that come to me and and they'll say, my, my child has this behavioral issue. Do you think it's pandas? And we do see them. So uh, there are times when we say, actually, no, we don't. Maybe they have an element of, you know, attention deficit disorder, or maybe they're somehow on the autistic spectrum. But it's pretty significant when you see it. These kids, a lot of times, will have facial tics as well. Uh, pandas is actually like a sort of a light version of um, Sydenham's chorea, which is associated mm-hmm. with strep infection. And those kids really have explosive sort of total body arm movement type presentations. And uh, so it's much less um, in our daughter's case, she was being defiant already. And I, I can remember her uh, sort of um, doing this kind of thing. And I kept saying to her, you're really bad at rolling your eyes at your mom. <laughs> <laughs> up actually being a facial tick. Uh, some kids will have a grunting <coughs> type tick as if they're clearing their throat. Um, and they'll have a lot of times a squinting tick. And so the hallmark is it's kind of out of nowhere. And you know, vocal ticks as well as facial ticks are seen a lot in Tourette's syndrome, um, as well as abnormal vocalizations and things like that. And, and there's been some studies which suggest that E. D. La Tourette, who originally defined Tourette's syndrome, may have been dealing with kids in that age range that actually had pandas. It was just unknown at that time. Wow. Those are the things we see. Wow. Would you agree that, at least in the males, a lot of them also have a degree of aggression? Like an impulsive, aggressive kind of... It's super common, especially they will sometimes be aggressive toward their siblings. So you'll see behavior where they're really rough on their siblings. They're, it's it's uncommon for them for the, for them to actually harm others. They do due to their impulsiveness. Um, they can harm themselves. So you have to be careful when they're in a heightened state, an anxious state, and they're really defiant. So my daughter, a few times when we were in the car, would unbuckle herself, and I've seen times when children would unbuckle themselves and want, and open the door and try and get out of the car. Uh, we haven't seen any tragedies, but I always kind of warn patients that. It, it can be really aggressive. And um, I had a young girl who went to Chicago with her parents for a trip to the museum. They slept in a hotel that may have had mold in it that may have triggered her symptoms. And I think we'll talk about that a bit later, but she woke up the next day and was not herself and went into a, a restaurant, was acting very unusually. And once again, sweet little 10 year old girl who's her mom's best friend and ended up pushing her mother into a glass case. Wow. Uh, because her mom was trying to control her behavior and saying, what's wow. the matter? Why are you acting this way? So we do see that. We see kids get in trouble in school as well, um, because if they're having issues with OCD or they're having to run to the bathroom or they're not wanting to eat their school lunch, other kids were having a vocal tick or clearing their throat. Other kids might not be as understanding. And so then they will lash out. These kids always have a sense that something's wrong. They know that they're not acting normally. Um, and it's a real struggle for them because they feel like they have to act this way, yet they know that it's it's not normal. Yeah, and you know, I think that that's one of the reasons why I feel a strong calling to do this because these poor children are almost obsessed. Uh, 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 they, they, they literally can't control what's happening to them. It's almost like a possession that that's taking place. And then when they check when they check back in, they realize what they've done, and they're so. 
uh, apologetic and just feeling bad. And I think what breaks my heart is so many of these kids come into my clinic and one of the first questions they ask me is, am I bad? Am I a bad child? Am I a bad person? And you know, it, it's heartbreaking to be someone that, that's one of the first people to tell them, you know what, no, you're not bad. Something is happening to you that's causing you to act this way, but this is not who you are. Perfect. Okay. I think that's I think, so profound. What's that? I said that's so profound. Um, you are exactly right. I, um, you know, when these kids are really in the, th the thick of it, when you look at them, they almost have a vacant look in their eyes. When I always ask moms to bring in a picture of before, um, also a picture of their handwriting before and their drawing skills before, because that deteriorates. But you'll see, I, I show people pictures sometimes of my daughter uh, when she was going through this, and her whole countenance of her face look differently, but I've had kids say the exact same thing to me. Am I bad? And <clears throat> they will be sitting sort of distracted and coloring. And when I actually say to them, you can get better. You have a sickness. This is like an infection. We can help your brain get better. And they, they always break what they're doing and look at me. And it's, it's, it's this desperate look that I'm not sure they feel like they could get better. And at that moment, and the other thing I commonly do is before I even start, I'll excuse the children from the room, usually with their other parent, if, if that's possible, remember my staff. And I always sit down with the moms and, and the first thing I say to them is I just look at them and say, this is not your fault. I mean, mom guilt is terrible and it, it's, it just takes everything out of them because they're torturing themselves, figuring out is this because I didn't give them their multivitamin last Thursday? Or is this because I potty trained them too young? Or is this because I work outside of the house? And it's just, it's a thing and it's a prison for the moms. And so for them to hear that um, is really, so I say the same thing to the kids um, that, you know, also telling the kids, you know, your behavior is your behavior and you can't behave in a cruel, mean way. You have to listen to your parents, but at the same reason, in the same way, a lot of what's going on in your brain is not your fault. Yeah, yeah but the, I think the tragic part is so many in the community are telling the parents and the child that it is their fault. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the parents are told by one psychiatrist after another, or psychologist or parenting expert or whomever that, you know what, no, you need to parent this way. Oh, this is a problem because of your marriage. You know, I, I had a, a family that went to go see a psychiatrist because uh, we wanted to see if the child could be put on meds just to control the behaviors until we can get everything else resolved. And the psychiatrist turned around and said, you know what, this is an issue with your marriage. You know, mm -hmm. and th these are parents that are like working so hard to manage and they had a perfect marriage before everything went south. And I think it's just such a tragedy that, you know, people have no idea that these children are actually sick. Um, and that, that possibility is discounted left and right. You're exactly right. And, um, you know, clearly there are marriages that weather this better than others, but it's, it's a true loss. One of the things you said earlier was a possession of your child. I, I've said about my own daughter and I've heard other parents say, it's as if, you know, your child goes to sleep, the next day you wake them up and it's a different child they suddenly wake up and won't put their shoes on or and you know when you look at it initially i've had to apologize to my daughter because there were times when i disciplined her when it was likely anxiety and pans that was active and it was not just pure defiance but it's so hard to tell you know especially if you're in public to you know want to discipline your child and if they start acting up you just there's a strong judgment of other folks not just medical people that there's judgment of other parents in the area that make assumptions. It's a look at what they let their daughter get away with or look at what's going on. And, you know, I'm not anti-medicine at all. The sad fact is that, you know, we gave my daughter some antidepressants to see if that would help to keep our, our house together. And it really didn't. And if you look at the literature, occasionally really high dose antidepressants, high for a child dose antidepressants, will sometimes provide a little bit of relief. but behaviorally um, it can really help to do cognitive behavioral therapy it's just super hard to find someone who understands pans and pandas and can do it yeah. but um, and i've also had people tell my uh, parents when i've sent them for cognitive behavioral therapy you know your doctor really 
doesn't know what they're doing, your child should be on these antipsychotics or antidepressants to help them manage this behavior. So, and that's hard. No, it is, and it's hard to deal with. And I, I try to, you know, we we all study different. There's a lot of ways to skin a cat. We say, um, and so I try never to talk down about what another clinician has done. They're, we're all doing our best to try and get the people well. Um, but I just think, you know, you and I have a little bit of a different toolbox, and so I'm, I'm glad that we do, and we can give some people some treatment that they might not get otherwise. But it is tragic. The whole thing is tragic, and it's somehow been become this divisive divisive issue. It's kind of like politics or religion or anything else. It's become this divisive issue with hands. And, you know, if I'd have known now what I know then from studying, from seeing these kids and treating hundreds of them, if I'd have known when I talked to the very first guy on the phone and he said, pandas doesn't exist, I would have said, well, gosh, there's a National Institute of Health inpatient unit in Washington, DC. Um, they give kids high dose IVIG, they do plasma exchange transfusions, they do rituximab, which is a immunosuppressive medication IV for the worst of the worst kids and these kids get better and they've written about it extensively. Mm -hmm. So the National Institute of Health, if you go to their website, has a whole section on pandas and pans and what you should do and who you should contact. And so they actually have a link in there to the pandas network for parents. It answers a lot of questions and the pandas network has a uh, provider list on there where you can find someone near you to help take care of your child. It, it's, it's sad. It's sad. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think this epidemic, because I, I see it as an epidemic, sadly, uh, you know, when we, when we start opening our eyes and looking, it seems like there are more and more and more children that are falling susceptible to this. And I'm sure you know, to some extent, we're just more aware of it, and I'm more aware of it because I know what to look for it. But do you think there's something happening to the immune systems of these children that ultimately are making them vulnerable to these various infections? Because there's plenty of kids that get strep, right? And sure. they don't go haywire. Uh, do you see certain things underlying the, the physiology or immunology of these children that, that causes them to be so vulnerable? We really do. So, um, you know, I think anytime you're seeing a, a population change, I mean, it, you know, we didn't hear about this years ago and, and there are a lot of things we didn't hear about. We've been really become really aware of things like autism and things in the last few years. But gosh, if you look at the amounts uh, of, you know, the autism epidemic. I think the last statistic I saw was one in 53 children has autism. And back in 2008, the number from the CDC was one in about 400. So if you did the math on that, you'd say there's been, what, a thousand percent increase or maybe more. Um, so our genetics haven't changed. And I don't know that the definition of autism has changed since 2008. So yes, it's always finding where people with it has become, we become more aware, but we also have to keep our eye out. But it's an interesting question you asked. Uh, you know, when I was a kid and you had a birthday in school, people could bring in a cake or bring in cookies and it wasn't a big deal. Today you can't because the allergy epidemic is just crazy. A lot of these kids have allergies, so it's really hard to do that. So most schools have a policy that you can't bring in outside treats and cookies and cake. Um, so it's been written that there's actually a toxin induced loss of tolerance. So tolerance is your immune system's ability to respond to things and not necessarily react. So if I drink something or eat something and it's not harmful toward me and it's not uh, overridden with bacteria, I really shouldn't develop a response to it. But now a lot of people are developing these things. So there's something that's assaulting our immune system. And anything that comes into your mouth, that you breathe, that you touch, that's around you, including thoughts and words, uh, all have to be processed. And so your body has to decide first whether it's you or not, and then it has to decide whether it's harmful. And if it's harmful, it has to come up with some kind of a strategy to deal with it. And so you're right, a lot of people get strep and they do fine. A lot of people get the flu and they do fine. Yet some people get it and have a lot of problems with it. And why is that? So. I think part of it's what folks are exposed to. So we know that people recover from illness better if they eat a better diet, if they eat more naturally, don't have as many organic pollutants in their diet. An organic diet, for example, tends to produce a stronger immune system. So there are the things where we've come in contact with. One of the big things that's a focus in our practice with both children and adults is mycotoxin illness from water damaged buildings. And so 
we do see a lot of this and it was once again in retrospect looking at my daughter so when we tested our daughter for infections she tested positive for lyme disease she had really high titers for strep um, as well as mycoplasma and one of her mycoplasma titers looked like it was an acute infection <laughs> so we started some antibiotics and treated those things but, you know i think there's a lot of people that have mycoplasma it's a common respiratory pathogen and it never causes any problem at all and so through testing what we found with these kids is an awful lot of these kids, when you test their immunoglobulins, have immune globulin deficiency. So your immunoglobulins are proteins, which help you respond to infections. And when people are deficient in one of those, you can have worse outcome with infections or more what are called opportunistic infections. They wouldn't affect most people the way they do, but these kids get hit and they get hit hard. So years ago, when I went through training, 25 years ago, we all knew about IgA deficiency and those folks tended to be older and get a lot of respiratory infections, but not a whole lot else. And these kids have a lot of IgG deficiencies. They also don't tend to respond to their vaccination. So one of the things we test is a lot of children now will get a pneumococcal vaccine. Prevnar might be one that people are familiar with the brand name. And after you get any vaccine, when you measure someone's immune globulins, they should have a response to that. You should be able to say, for example, when I was a kid, I was vaccinated and I've been vaccinated against tetanus. If you measure now, I should have a titer against tetanus. That means I'm probably protected. These kids will get their immunizations and we will test their immunity and they will have none. They don't make antibodies to the things specifically pneumococcal vaccine is one that we can measure. There are 23 different antibodies that should become positive when they get that vaccination. These kids will have two or three. And so it indicates that their immune system is not responding to stimulus and not making normal protective antibodies. And so what happens in pans and pandas is those antibodies, when they get an acute infection, cross the brain, blood brain barrier, get into their brain and attack their brain, producing the symptoms that we see. So I mentioned mycotoxins. When you have water damage in your house, and one in two houses do, um, you can see that then microbes will start to grow. So bacteria will grow mold will grow that's the kind of big one we worry about it's really not the mold itself it's the chemicals that are produced by molds molds produce organic compounds think about it kind of like acetone that you clean your nail polish off with that's like an organic compound gasoline things like that and so mold mycotoxins usually are odorless so if you smell a musty smell in your basement or you smell like something like that you probably have mold growth but just because you don't doesn't mean your house is safe so i always ask parents about uh, mold in their homes. And the reason is I started recognizing after we saw these kids, I had about four or five families bring me siblings in that both developed symptoms of PANS or huh. PAN. And I said, well, I, I suppose they have genetics in common. These weren't twins, <laughs> but I suppose they have genetics in common. They were a year or two apart. But I started thinking and saying, you know, I don't know. And one of the things we see with patients who come to me and say, I've had a big water damage event in my house. And a lot of times folks with mycotoxin illness from mold exposure will have varied symptoms. Some of them neurologic, brain fog, headaches, um, numbness in different parts of their body, weakness. A lot are diagnosed with fibromyalgia or complex regional pain syndrome. So they'll come and see us. And I started seeing some parallels. Some of these kids with pandas, in addition to defiance and bladder issues, they also would have unusual pain, migrating joint pain. Uh, they would have pins and needles. A lot of what was the problem with, they would have these symptoms of what we'd call sensory integration. They didn't want to wear socks or only liked loose clothing or pants. Um, and so it was almost like a, a neuropathy or a nerve type pain that these kids were having. And so that sounded an awful lot like what we saw in adults with mold exposure and also with tick-borne disease. So we started testing these children for more than just strep, for more than just mycoplasma. And it was amazing that a proportion of them had tick-borne disease and a larger proportion as well had mold in their environment. So there were several siblings where we initially began treating them for uh, pandas or pans and then would find, I would ask the mom or the dad and they would say, oh, by his as a matter of fact, last year we had a water event in our home and our basement flooded. We were away on vacation and didn't discover it for a week. And then we got it cleaned out, think everything's fine. And we haven't seen any mold, which is what a lot of folks would say. But when we 
um, go on and have them get someone to qualify to do a test of their home, sure enough, they'll find mold or elevated mycotoxins or both. And we now have testing we can do in adults and children. It's urine testing, so no blood's needed for it. And we do that and test for the presence of mycotoxin in people. And some of these kids have very, very high levels of urine mycotoxins. And then you can then treat them and, and help them overcome it. So, wow. promise. Wow. It, it's it's mind boggling when you piece all of this together, right? You, you look at one thing at the surface and then there's another and then there's another layer and another layer. And I commend you for, for being this incredible investigator to, to have put all of this together. And that, that's why I'm so happy that you're here sharing your, your wisdom because I don't think there's a lot of practitioners out there like you. You know, uh, I, I commend the people that are focusing on the pans and pandas and I think they're doing amazing work. And I, I certainly think there's huge value in what they're doing. But, you know, I've also seen some of the cases where they, the children got labeled as pans, pandas. You know, they, they got the six months of antibiotics and whatever else. And some of these kids have gotten worse. And those are the kids that in some cases I found the, the mycotoxins, as you suggested. So, yeah, that's, that's really, but thank you. But um, that's really it. You know what it comes down to is asking the right questions. And I always tell people that I don't, claim you know i don't claim to be any smarter than anybody else i just keep asking questions it's what we did with our daughter okay if, if i know she has a diagnosis if you don't believe in it who does who can help me with this when i know it's true i've seen the medical literature out of the national institute of health i know it's real sorry you don't believe that but who can i next ask that was the question then now i find someone to go to and they say ivig i ask someone and they say I don't do that, that doesn't make sense. Fine, who can I ask now? And that's what we tend to do with our patients and I know that's what you do with your patients, It's just asking the right question. And you know, uh, it's hard, right? Medicine has become hard these days. There's a lot of talk about physician burnout because people are seeing so many patients so quickly, seven minute visit in and out and it's hard to ask enough questions. But if you do, you know, Osler in the 1800s said, if you ask the patients the right question, they'll tell you what's wrong with them. And it's really the question, but. You hit the nail on the head because when we first started seeing pandas kids, um, you would look at them and you'd kind of, you know, almost pat yourself in the back and say, hey, mom, I know what's wrong. It's pandas. But now we've come and taken a step back and say, well, why pandas? Why did that happen? So, yes, we can treat pandas, but you're exactly right. The folks in our practice and when we got into really treating a lot of mold patients, there's this small group of patients in your practice and you'd say, gosh, I did all the integrative functional things on these folks. I fixed their diet and I got them to meditate or pray. I got them, you know, to go to counseling and, you know, really remove toxins from their home and all those things. And you'd have this little portion of people that still were kind of a disaster. And then when we really started digging into this and finding that, that's how you really find it is, is you know, that, you know, you, you're doing the same thing where did this doctor of last resort where you, you say, okay, I'm looking at everything, but I'm gonna go into this with a clean mind and a clean set of hands. And I'm not gonna see this next kid coming in as a pandas kid, they're just a kid. And maybe they don't have pandas at all. Maybe everyone missed it. And so that's kind of my motto in the ER. They say the highest risk patients in the ER are the bounce back patients who come in after they've already been seen because you know, someone previously who saw them might've said, I think they're hypochondriac or I think they have anxiety. And I, I always like, when I go in to see those patients with residents, I always say, forget everything you know, don't read the other chart. Go straight and take your own history, do your own thing. Fine, look at the chart later, find out what tests were done, but you can really get complacent and then that's really bad for patients. So it, it really is about asking the right patients for sure, uh, right patients the right questions for sure and digging deeper and you've got it though. You know, when you see that patient that doesn't make sense to you and you say, Certainly looks like pandas. A lot of those kids will get better with antibiotics. Some need plus or minus steroids for a period of time. And, you know, you treat these infections, do these things and say it's not going the way that it should. You really got to take a step back and once again, start asking questions. Was I right to begin with? Is this pandas? And that's, I really think, part of the art of medicine. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I love what you touched on in terms of asking the right questions. And, you know, part of why I'm creating this system is to help ask the right questions so parents can get the right guidance. Because unfortunately, I think there's too few of you out there that, that have the, the experience and knowledge to ask all of the right questions. 
And part of what I'm hoping to do through Holistic Minds is basically just create a system that asks all the right questions for families and says, you know what, you may have this or this or this, go talk to your physician or bring in your healthcare team to help you explore these possibilities. Because uh, it is easy to become complacent or, you know, sadly, in some cases, people just don't know. You know, the psychiatrist doesn't know about mold, you know, and they, they may have the best of all intentions, but for them, they're only processing from the angle of, well, this is probably a parenting issue or, you know, yeah. the, the occupational therapist is like, well, they probably just have a sensory integration and that has to do with, you know, them not crawling and they don't know how to put all of these pieces together like you do. Uh, and p part of what I'm really trying to do is bring in together all of the pieces so parents can have all of the, the right questions and sets to be able to piece together the puzzle that is their child. Yeah, what uh, a great what a great thing that is. That's such a noble calling that you have. Um, you know, one of our limitations is for right now, and we're working on some online programs and things, but is that we see patients across the desk. So I can't reach everybody. I have a limited <laughs> amount of hours that I'm open that I can see patients, but for you to produce something that can go directly to the parent, because these folks, these parents are up late at night on the internet, searching around blindly for information. They're crying on the keyboard. That was us. You know, even being physicians, even being in integrative medicine, getting hit with something like this, it's like out of the blue. These parents are sleep deprived. And then a lot of times they're going to someone and you know, if I were to look at that, I was talking to my wife about this yesterday as I was talking about, you know, let's go over the timeline with him. I want to make sure I'm getting everything right. And, you know, the first call we actually made was to her primary pediatrician. Hmm. And my wife had already done labs and said, I did these labs, faxed them over to the office and said, I think she has pandas, please help. Never got a call back. Hmm. You know, I, I can't presume to speak for the pediatrician at that time, but just these parents are lost. I mean, this yeah. is... My story is what happened to me. I'm a physician calling saying, this is Dr. Antoine. I'm an emergency department attending. I've been a doctor for 12 years or 15 years at that point. And I still had the same thing happen to me. And I'm sure it, it may be worse for parents. So I really applaud you for coming out with something that will address a lot of these things that are medical mysteries and, and uh, gosh, so needed, so needed. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I'm sure just like with you, I feel this is a calling. This, this is my duty to do so because I mean, I don't even know how many people in the U.S. and around the world are suffering, you know, and these poor children are devastated. Uh, and, you know, I think the saddest part is if these issues are not addressed, what happens to these children as they grow up to become adults? Right? Sure. They're, they're disabled, they're, they're ultimately branded as psychotic or as ADHD, they're put on antipsychotics. And I wish the medications work, at least in my experience, most of the time they backfire and just make these kids that much worse. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I wish they did too. I always tell folks I'm an integrative functional medicine physician, so some folks will come into my office and I always tell them right off the bat, you've never met me, I'm not anti-medicine, all medicines have their place. And I'm with you, boy. If, if someone could make a medication tomorrow that didn't have side effects, that was effective, or side effects you could deal with, but was effective for these kids, they're so tortured. I, I would use the medicine in every one of these kids. So I'm not you know, a conspiracy theory, like anti-medicine guy, and I know you aren't either, but your results are exactly what the literature says, which are my results with these kids as well. I've tried medications, does not help. Um, and so the, the, the most, prescription medicines that have been most helpful for me have been steroids at times and antibiotics definitely um, based on what I've found and then a lot of times uh, going on to intravenous immunoglobulin and IVIG therapy which is awesome but it's a blood product that has its own risks and, and benefits and it has to be given IV which starting an IV in these kids is, <laughs> is not always fun um, but you know you do what you can do and that's sort of a almost a last ditch and a lot of times we end up doing that. But yeah, you're right. If, if we could find a, a medication, I'd be all in, in favor of it. Yeah, yeah, me too. And you know, it, it's, it's funny for me, I don't really see cases of straightforward ADHD anymore because mm -hmm. in those children where it is just ADD, ADHD, you know, a little bit of diet change and, and, and stimulant works so well that it's almost not worth uh, putting the parents through a prolonged, kind of workup 
Uh, whereas with these kids, there are no other options, which is why I'm here. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. How do you strategize your treatments? I know it's way beyond the, the scope of this discussion to actually get into detailed treatments because that's a whole different can of worms. Sure. But how do you strategize like where you go? When, when do you, do you always look for mold if you have pandas? How, how do you kind of layer your, your investigation and treatment? Like and if you've got like a pandas case, but there's mold, mm -hmm. you go after the mold first, do you treat the pandas? Like how, how do you organize your treatments and kind of figure out where to go first? It's funny, a few years ago, I had a physicist come to me to be seen as a patient. And when I saw her, and I don't quite remember what she was there for, but I sort of prevent, presented my treatment plan and I said, look for, you know, you have issues with lipids, we're gonna start some omega-3 fats and then you have some issues with your blood pressure, we're gonna use some Hawthorne Berry and kind of went through a comprehensive plan that addressed each of the things that she had come in with. And she said, well, I'm a physicist and I've been one for years and that's not science. A scientist would check one thing at a time and maybe give me fish oil and then bring me back. And if my lipids aren't better, try something else. And well, the problem is, you know, your body is not like that. It's not like a laboratory experiment. It's like a car. So, you know, when you have a car, you put gas and oil and coolant and brake fluid in it. So we really have to address everything, right? And I know that's what you do as well. So when we have these kids come in uh, and the complaint is possible pandas, we send them out a pandas questionnaire for the parents. And it basically has the National Institute of Health definition on there, which is occurs suddenly between the ages of three and puberty and it usually has it either OCD or restrictive eating. Uh, and then there's a bunch of minor criteria. If you have at least two, one of the major criteria, which is restrictive eating or OCD, plus two of the minor criteria, then you can establish the diagnosis. The minor criteria are things like facial tics, sensory problems, bladder issues, insomnia, uh, deterioration in school performance. And so we kind of take a look at that, but it's interesting. There was just in, um, a talk given at I think it was Rutgers, but I may be wrong, um, by a specialist in pandas who said that in her practice, and we've seen this as well, we're seeing some of these kids with subacute presentations. So they're coming in and it's been, you know, I noticed over the last six months, but boy, they peg the definition every other, other, other way. And so a lot of those kids end up having mycotoxins in my experience. So it's just, it's not a, as acute or as sudden as an infectious trigger. So we look at them and we have a five-step process we go through and it's what we take all our patients through. We call it the fully functional process. So the first step is identify. And so asking the right questions, we ask about the houses they've lived in, exposures to illness, any prior immune deficiency, what their birth was like, um, whether they were breastfed or not, whether they were immunized and kind of go through and look for um, the like at the lay of the land. And then we figure out which testing we're going to do. Um, so. What I can tell you at this point is probably within the last six months, I've started doing mycotoxin testing on, I think every pandas case, just because it's so prevalent. Similar to me, my, similarly, my adult autoimmune patients, I told my wife I'm almost at the point where I feel like all autoimmune patients have some contribution from mycotoxin in their illness some way. It's like a trigger. Anyway, um, but so we'll, we'll do that. We'll test for mycotoxins. Depending on their clinical scenario and what their symptoms are like, it'll determine whether we test for which infectious diseases. We always test ASO antibodies and anti-DNAase antibodies to see if they're high. But even if they're normal, it still may be pans or pandas. We test some other infectious diseases, typically tick-borne diseases. And then we do the general testing. We do an ion panel, which looks for organic acids. We um, we will check for food allergies and sensitivities because those are inflammatory and can make the condition worse. Um, but it's funny, you know, all our kids like yours that come in with ADHD, boy, sometimes you do an elimination diet or you eliminate food allergens and they get a whole lot better. My experience with these pandas kids is that doesn't happen. In fact, I, I almost never restrict their diet if they have any restrictive eating at all, because I don't want to get into taking away from an already limited diet. And similarly, if they were super behaviorally defined. Uh, insisting that they eat half their plate of vegetables or um, we're going to switch you out to gluten-free bread doesn't go over very well. And no, so in the, terms of, over the edge. in the terms of keeping the peace in the house, I'll tell parents, till we get them through this, do your best. <laughs> and so we do kind of fix their diet. And so then we, we try after we're identifying things and doing things, 
Then the next few steps we do at the same time. So a lot of these labs take a while, right? So they're send out labs, allergy testing, stool testing to look for yeast overgrowth. And so those are gonna take a while, but we don't wanna leave the parents in alert. So we will do, if we can, an anti-inflammatory diet, at least eliminating junk, if you can. Um, so processed sugars, foods, dyes, um, anything in a box, bag, or can, if you can do that. Um, and then we will, depending on the child, depending on what's going on, a lot of times we will start a trial of antibiotics, um, try and tailor it to what we think is going on. Most of the time people will use Augmentin initially because the clavulonic acid, there are a few articles that suggest that it's anti-inflammatory hmm. uh, and it may have a central nervous system anti-inflammatory effect. So a lot of folks will use Augmentin. If I have a strong possibility or a suspicion that it's mycoplasma or uh, tick-borne disease, a lot of times I will use azithromycin. We can use doxycycline in kids that are a little bit older. If the behavior is really out of control, I may try a very short trial of steroids, either before or after antibiotics. And then we do some general anti-inflammatory things, which we try. Some parents will use uh, longer periods of ibuprofen for that. I don't like to do that. It's hard on the stomach. It's not great for the kidneys. So I will use curcumin or boswellia, frankincense for that. There are some essential oils we can use for that. I know you have some homeopathics up your sleeve that are helpful in that. Or Which essential oils do you like? Uh, so it really depends on the case. So um, a lot of times we will use calming essential oils, lavender, things like that to calm them. Um, if we're going for digestive issues, sometimes we'll use peppermint oil. We almost always use them externally. Um, they don't do so well taking them internally, but um, so we do use them. We also use some topical medications. A lot of times it's difficult. Kids will not swallow pills. So some other things that we use, one of the things is low-dose naltrexone, which seems to modulate the immune system and help. And we can get that in a syrup. We also can get it in a topical cream that parents can put on. Um, we will use glutathione, which is your body's master antioxidant and detoxifier. So there are some liposomal forms that the moms can put in their mouth. And if that doesn't work, there are topical forms as well. So those are some things that we would do initially. So you go after the infections first and then clean up the mold afterwards. Um, we're sort of doing everything at the same time. So um, a lot of times when I first see them we in these kids, so there's sort of controversy here, right? So people write and they'll say, for example, with Lyme disease, there's been a lot written in, in uh, integrative medicine circles where people will say, oh, if people have Lyme disease, but they have mold exposure, you always clear up the mold exposure first before you ever give them anything to treat Lyme. To be honest, there's really not a lot of literature that supports that. It's often repeated. Um, and so I think it kind of depends on the person. If I find something right off the bat, it depends on the severity of the illness as well. So if we're looking at um, treating mold, we're going to want to talk about binders like activated charcoal and things like that and glutathione. Um, and a lot of times I'm waiting to get a stool test done or I'm waiting to get, you can't, you shouldn't really use binders if you're testing for urine mycotoxins because it can affect the results. So a lot of times I'll just start right off the bat with some antibiotics. Um, there are actually, actually some herbs that you can do as well, which can help with immune protection. We don't commonly do, do those. They don't always taste very good. It just depends. <laughs> Adults do better with those, I think. Um, but um, yeah, so I think that um, the best way to understand that I think is if someone's living in a moldy house, they just won't get better. So, you know, you can have someone on antibiotics for three and a half years for Lyme. And we see that sometimes patients will come into our office and they'll say, I have resistant Lyme disease. I've been on six different antibiotics, three at a time for two and a half years and I'm no better. And when we ask them a question about their house, there it is, there's the water damage, there's the mold. And I almost feel like, once again, I, there's no medical literature to support this, but just based on our experience, some of these folks that we struggle, struggle, struggle with infection with, once you get them out of the moldy environment and get binders and remove the mycotoxins, I think their immune system gets up to speed and just gets better and helps beat those other infections down and they overcome them. because. I think there's a good proportion of the society in this country and probably around the world that get Lyme disease and it's a little more significant than a strep throat. They get it, it goes away and they're never bothered. Yet there are some of these folks that really have lifelong torture with it. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a whole new world of medicine. It really is. It's, uh, 
You know, I always say that doing what I do now, uh, functional integrative medicine, made me fall in love with medicine again. Yeah. Because it can really get tedious. Um, a lot of the way we're trained, the way we were trained in, in uh, medical school was, if you're the king of the hill if you made the diagnosis. So they would present some obscure case and it didn't so much matter, unfortunately, if you could help the patient. If you could find out they had a pancos tumor or henox schoenlein purpura, then you were the king of the diagnostic hill. And the problem is when you can't fit patients into a box, um, when they have symptoms that are so outrageously strange and multi-system, you're faced with two things. If you can't put an ICD-10 code or a diagnosis on it, either you're not very good at what you're doing, uh, which can be an ego issue, or a lot of these patients, I would have to say more than 60% of the patients in our practice have been told that it's all in their head. Yeah. Adults and kids have been told there's really nothing wrong with you or it's anxiety. Um, it, it just, and it's, it's tragic and it makes me angry. And so I have to, in my anger, sit there and try and not implicate other people they may have seen before, but it just makes me so mad. One of the last pandas kids I saw went to a children's hospital in one of the surrounding states and they sent the visit notes over and the visit notes said, uh, another case of fake pandas disproven. Oh. And they sent the child out with medications to treat Tourette's. And this child had severe, um, I had severe pandas and ended up recovering after we got the child IVIG and restored the immune system. And it just, it makes you so mad. You try and not, I try and, I guess I breathe. I try to breathe the exercises. I pray. I do what I can to get over that and not be judgmental, but it's really infuriating sometimes for these. You know, I don't so much mind that it, another practitioner might not know this. It matters how patients are treated and that these poor moms and dads are just, they're already tortured and then to go in someplace and hear, you know, it's not what you thought it was or stop bringing that up. And, you know, and I just, it, it burdens me. Like I know it burdens you. It does. It does. It, it, it's, it's tragic. Like you said, it, it's really sad. And, you know, the part that I find interesting is a lot of times these other practitioners don't know what to do with these patients. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's clear to them that the case is a puzzle, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they're so quick to discount the possibility of other things. Right. So it, it, it's really interesting to see the dynamics happening in, in certain domains of medicine. And, you know, I think that's why both you and I are here. You know, at the end of the day, we want to help the patients and You've, you've experienced dramatic changes and I've seen kids transform and I think those transformations that we witness are what drive us to do what we do. You're exactly right. Those are the, you know, those kids that you sit and, and think about, um, you know, I can pull 10 names off <laughs> the top of my head that you just think, you know, this was virtually discounted as a lost case. And, and um, we really try and counsel the parents to um, help the parents know what questions to ask in school to get an IEP or a 504 or something to help the child so that they're not penalized academically for what's going on behaviorally. And we've also, I've talked to people in children's schools to educate them and let them know what's going on. It's something we had to do for our own daughter. But um, yeah, it's, it's rewarding from that standpoint if you have people who will listen. And boy, when kids get better, that's like uh, the best thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. There's no money you could put on that. It's no. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. Th thank you for holding this space for all these families. And thank you for being here to, to share all your wisdom and experience. Well, thank you. I really, um, I really enjoyed talking to you and I enjoyed time we've spent together out outside of podcasts. And I really am um, looking forward to see um, what you're going to come up with next. I'm really excited and I'm excited to point my patients to it as a way to really help them understand their kids and understand the needs around their kids. Someone needs to really uh, give them sort of that old fashioned wisdom that maybe our grandmoms knew that <laughs> maybe <laughs> appeared in the last few months. Maybe we rely a little bit too much on physicians and need to get back to those days. And, and uh, so it's great. I look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening. This is Dr. K from Holistic Minds and a big thank you to Dr. Scott Antoine for, for the work that he's doing and the brilliance that he's bringing into the medicine and care that he's providing to his patients. Thank you. My pleasure.